Hello and welcome everyone to the fifth session in American English Series 20. We're so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Dr. Darlene Wiggins Dockery, and I'll be with you today as your host. And joining us behind the scenes is my colleague, Elena, who will be answering questions for you and responding to your comments during the session as she serves as our moderator. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Understanding What You're Hearing, Teaching Pronunciation Features for Listening Comprehension with Paula Runnels. We heard from Ayin from Irene, I'm sorry, from Venezuela, who said, I had never heard about teaching super segmentals before. I will share this info with my coworkers. Thanks for the examples you showed. I will use them in my next activities with my students. So thank you, Irene, for getting in touch with us and letting us know how valuable this experience was for you. We also heard from Iman from Egypt, who said, the session was impressive and taught me that it's very important to show my students when to pause when they speak and whether it's a short or a long pause. And I learned other tips that I can apply to. Finally, we heard from Asman from Ghana who said, it was very beneficial and will help me professionally in my lesson delivery on listen, listening comprehension, especially using the super segmental features to teach listening comprehension. So we love to hear from our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback through the end of session quiz or by emailing them to American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments in our next webinar. Throughout series 20, we are exploring a variety of strategies for developing listening skills in the English language classroom. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas that we share. So here's what you can expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will share the material and I, your host, will ask questions and make comments. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please share your comments, your thoughts in the comments feature or the chat box. When our session comes to a close, you will have the opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of the three multiple choice questions correctly. And if you successfully pass the quiz on your first attempt, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, we want to make sure you know about one of our current massive open online courses, Creating and Implementing Online Courses. In this free course, participants will learn best practices and powerful tools for creating and implementing online courses. The MOOC is open now and enrollment closes September 23rd. Use the link being shared by the moderator to learn more and to enroll today. Now for today's webinar. 
Adventures in Teaching Intercultural Listening. Well-developed listening skills are essential for both non-native and native English speaking lit language learners. Sadly, listening instruction tends to be one of the most neglected areas of English language teaching. Creative and relevant ways to address this skill are often lacking. This webinar will explore fresh approaches to listening instruction that teachers can adopt or adapt to help students become successful listeners, both in and out of the classroom. Several free resources for developing a communicative listening curriculum will also be shared. And we are pleased to introduce our presenter, Johnny Lynn Hill. Johnny is an English language instructor whose research interests include designing and using games in teaching and, and materials development, particularly for listening and academic writing. She has taught English in eight countries and to students from early primary levels through graduate school. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm excited to be able to share adventures in intercultural listening. Today, as we as you listen, I have some jobs for you. So if you'll look, there are some cues there. Sometimes I will ask you to respond with a very short answer, sometimes a letter or maybe a word. Sometimes I'll ask you to give a longer answer and type your reflection. And sometimes uh, there's a lot of material today and I won't be able to cover everything that I would like to cover. So I have directed you for a deeper dive and you'll understand that metaphor later on. Um, so, so places where you can find more information about a particular topic. And this will also be show up on the reference list at the end. So here's our first adventure today. We're going to explore the power of attention. Dr. Darlene, which do you think is more important to train listeners to pay attention or to train speakers to be more engaging? Hmm. Well, I think that both to be an effective communication, our very communicator are very important. However, as an English speaker and an American, we are typically trained to teach speakers to be more engaging. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. I mean, if you look at a, a landmark essay by John Hines, he also says that um, in English speaking cultures, it's more important for the speaker to have the responsibility mm -hmm. for the communication. So they need to be engaging. Whereas the listeners, it's more effective. I mean, in some cultures, like the Japanese culture is what he, he theorizes, um, that it's more the responsibility of the listener to understand what is said and mm. then on the speaker. So I'd like to turn this over to our, our audience today. And which one do you think? Who is primarily responsible for effective communication in your culture, the speaker or the listener? As you tell us, could you also share where you're from? Okay, so let's see what responses are coming in. All right. Well, we heard from Cherevel, um, and I don't know what country, but it says to train speakers to be more engaging. So similar to our English speaking culture. Mm -hmm. um, Isabel said, Tapia said both. Fatima said, I think both of them are necessary, but if a speaker would be more clear, listener would be able to understand everything. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we heard from Valeria, 
who said the speaker, Valeria is from Belarus. Um, we heard from Edgar, and Edgar said the speaker, and Edgar is from the Philippines. We also heard from Monica, who is from Brazil. And Monica said, in my culture, the speaker, though I think the listener. And then we heard from Yulia, who is from Russia, who said the speaker. So those are some of the responses we have received. So it seems like there are a lot of speakers, or a lot of cultures that really emphasize the importance of speaking clearly and being engaging. And mm. that's our, that's really, as teachers, that's our first principle that we need to learn is that attention is the key and mm. students need to learn to pay attention. Um, but what is intercultural listening? Intercultural listening is the process of interpreting messages from people who may have a different view of the world than you do. And we'll be looking at some of those differences. It could be in their knowledge of their customs, their, ru their rules, the attitudes, the beliefs. So as an intercultural listener, you need to know these as well as have good listening skills. And why should we teach these? Because it will boost the confidence of our students. If they feel like they can listen well and that they have the knowledge of the culture, then they, they will become more confident as listeners. And then that in turn will prepare them for, um, for interacting with people from all around the world. As I was thinking, as I was preparing this, I was thinking we probably have lots of different intercultural listening classrooms. Because um, some of the classrooms may be like in Indonesia, you may have an Indonesian teacher who's teaching her Indonesian students. And so they're all of the same culture and really the only exposure that they have to the English language is what they hear in the audios, in the audio recordings or on videos. And um, so their, and their needs are going to be different from those who like the one, like the classroom on the right, where you have students who are living in an English speaking country and they're interacting with an English speaking teacher. And so they're probably going to need to know a little bit more about uh, nonverbal communication. Whereas the ones in the, where everybody share, shares the same culture, um, it's a little harder to really to focus on nonverbal cues. So today what we'll be looking at in this is, I mean, if you're interested in nonverbal cues, you can look at the webinar about from Mendelssohn. If, um, but for the rest of us, we're going to really focus on what's going to be beneficial for any classroom for listening comprehension. And as I was saying before, the first key, our first principle is that attention is the key. I mean, this is pretty evident that if you stop paying attention, you're not going to understand anything. So you really need to um, pay attention. And as teachers, it's our it's our goal really to engage our students and make sure and help them to learn how to pay attention. So when listening to speech in another language, it's very easy to get distracted. I don't know if you've ever been in another culture, have you? Where you had to listen to another language and if you didn't have some sort of a meaningful task or uh, then you maybe lost interest or you gave up because it was just too difficult. And so some of the things that we can do as teachers is we can give our students meaningful tasks like listen for a certain word or listen for the ideas that are being shared. We can also ask them, we can also adjust the length to their attention span. So beginners, we might give them a very short thing to listen to, whereas the more advanced students, we could, we could give them longer um, recordings to, to listen to and respond to. And then for generating interest, it's also good if we can give our students choices. Now, I know some people it's really difficult if you're in a situation where the school has said you need to teach from this book, you need to cover this material, but I think you can still give students choices to um, work in groups or to work individually or um, give them some chat topics that they can that they can look at and maybe give them some ideas of different ways that they could approach the material. In order to really think about this, how to increase student um, engagement, I've prepared an, an, a game which will 
and it's, it engages the whole class and it can even engage very large classes. Uh, the technology is not required. And really the only preparation you need is to write the questions and the answers for the, for the game. It's a good game for reviewing grammar and vocabulary on any topic. And it's also based on an American television game show so that you can have a little bit of a taste of American culture while you're playing it. To play this game, I call it the crowd game. Um, you get points by answering the questions correctly. And actually you get points from the people who answered incorrectly. We'll be looking at this a little bit closely. Um, you'll need to have one person who sits on the hot seat, but that person who sits on the hot seat is not the only one that answers. Everybody answers the question. So generally I have the person on the hot seat with their back to the rest of the class and I arrange to have symbols like true or false or something so that, so that I can see what the students are responding and the person in the hot seat doesn't know. But then the person in the hot seat has to answer out loud with the question and maybe explain why they're answer why they're answering a certain way. So Darlene, do you think you could be our hot seat today? Of course. I'm gay. I'm gay. <laughs> All right, good. Thank you. So our first question and our audience, your job is to answer true or false this time. So you can write in T for true or F for false. And we're still stuck on the same slide here. In her webinar, and this was the first webinar in series 20, April Salerno told the audience that interrupting is always rude and that it's a mm -hmm. sign you're not listening very well. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is true or false? That's false because she said that um, it depends on the culture, it depends on the context, and she she even mentioned how even within a culture it can be um, different. For example, she she talked about her family versus her husband's family. So I'm going I'm going with that's false. Oh, so you were listening very well, but and I, I, I like your answer. But for the sake of the, I mean, do you think that the for the sake of modeling the game, do you think we could use one of the helps? Because there are three types of helps that you can use. Okay. So I mean, you said you're already confident about the answer. Now with polling the crowd, you would have to accept whatever their answer was. Do you trust okay. the crowd enough to say that they're going to answer right? Or you I do. I trust them? our I trust our participants. I do. <laughs> okay. Okay, if you poll the crowd, then you have to accept their answer. And if okay. the answer is indeed false, like you, as you've said, then you'll get, and you have 15 students who answers that it's true, then you would get 15 points. However, okay. if the answer is true, then the students who answered true will each get two points. So, so they'll okay. get your point plus the 29 students who answered incorrectly. Okay, okay but I still trust them. I still trust them. You still them. trust them. And <laughs> yes, from what I've seen still. over here, it looks like a lot of them are saying false. So that's a very good trusting with you. And so it looks like that you have the 15 points um, Thank you. for answering it. I mean, I haven't <laughs> counted everybody yet. Oh, uh, well, we'd have thousands to count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so we'll just go with what, what's up here on the screen, and we'll say that 15, answer, 15 of the students said that that was true. Okay. All Are right. you ready for this? So your score is now 15 points. Are you ready for okay. the next question? I am. Okay. In question two, in their webinar, and this was on the second mm -hmm. week, mm -hmm. Anita Dimitrov and Ann Haggerson said that listening activities should be short and sweet. Now I should warn you that that yellow triangle is there for a reason. This is a okay. trick question. Okay. Did they so. say it should be short and sweet? They said it should be short and something. Um, they said it should be short. Would you and like to model the asking the host and I, show how to do the help? Yes. I mean, you sound I confident in the answer, but. I, I, I would like to use one of my helps. Okay. so. Um, actually, the tricky part is the and sweet part. Did okay. they really say and sweet, or did they say short and something else? I want to use one of my helps. Can we, um, we told the help last you? time. So what are my options? Can I use a, a help that I've used before, like polling? 
or um, if you want to poll, you could because technically you haven't used that one yet, but you still also have the help of asking a friend. So you can look at one of the answers that's coming up and decide if you like their answer. I'm going to ask a friend then. Mm -hmm. I see the friend I don't have on my glasses. So let's see what friend I'm going to ask. I am asking Yulia, who said false. So I'm going with Yulia's answer. Okay, let's review the next slide. It'll show us about the scoring. So you've answered false. And if the answer is indeed false, then you'll get 34 points because 34 students answered true. And you'll get 15 points from the last question, so you'll have 49 points. Okay. If, however, the correct answer is true, then those who answer true are each going to get a point. Okay. And if you're a little bit, if you're a little, if you're not confident in the answer, or if we need to move on like we do, uh, you could just say that you want to keep your 15 points and let somebody else have the hot seat. Okay, so then I will keep my 15 points. It's, I'm pretending to be the student and I would want to hang on to my points. Okay. So, okay. Okay, and the correct answer is indeed false. You were right. And it, but it was that they should be short and frequent. So we should give them lots short of opportunities for listening. Okay. okay. So let's go on to our next adventure. And our next adventure is that we should seek ways to create a relaxed environment. If you're familiar with Stephen Krashen, then you probably, well, relax listeners hear better. And if you're familiar with Stephen Krashen, then you probably know about his effective filter in which he states that it seems that those who are have low anxiety or those that have low stress can actually it helps them to learn. So it's conducive to second language acquisition. And some ways that you can create a, a relaxed environment is by playing games, by doing drama or role plays, by telling stories and using chats. And we'll also be looking at some strategies that you can, that you can teach your students and maybe even use as yourself as an intercultural listener to help them increase or improve their listening comprehension. So now it's your turn. How do you create a relaxed environment in your language classroom? Okay, so we want to hear from you. What do you do to create a relaxed environment in your English language classroom? See if any responses are coming in. We have a bit of a delay. So um, mm -hmm. while we wait for responses, um, I want to give you a comment that we received from Sonia, who said these activities engage students and by involving through their responses, students feel anxiety free. And that is absolutely right, Sonia. Um, that is the goal that students, it removes the anxiety. So thank you for your comment. Uh, we've heard in response to the question, how do you create a relaxed environment in your English language classroom? We heard from Iram, who said affective filter must be lower. We heard from Danya, who said a quiet and calm atmosphere to boost their listening skills. We heard from Monica, who said playing games. Um, we also heard from Sonia, who said, through playing their favorite song. Uh, we heard from Wasi, who said, be friendly and polite with students. From Lourdes, we heard explaining that mistakes are part of the learning process. From May, do warm up activities. Dominique said, jokes, dance, and role play. Um, Hati said, arrange the seating in a way that promotes interaction and comfort, such as a circle or small groups. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the responses we have received. Right. Back to you. Well, thank you for your responses. Um, when I think about relaxing, I think about my grandparents' house. And my one of my grandfather's favorite pastimes was working crossword puzzles. 
So today we're going to do a listening strategies crossword puzzle. And um, I think the benefits of this are, it's a relaxing activity, so it can help the students to relax. It also helps them to experience the idea mm -hmm. of how Americans spend their leisure time. Uh, these are very good because you can review vocabulary and um, from lots of topics. You can review what they've already done, or you can also use this to introduce vocabulary. Mm. Now, in, in my case, what mm. I've also done, you notice there that there are no clues there. Yes, that's I, quite essential. <laughs> quite essential. Well, what I'm going to do to promote listening is I'm actually going to dictate the clues to you. Okay. So, um, oh, okay, also one of the, what I didn't mention before was the technology is not required and there are on the internet, you can find lots of different crossword puzzle makers or generators and you just put in your vocabulary list and the, um, and the definitions and it'll give, you a, it'll give you a crossword puzzle that you can use with your students. Okay, so Darlene, are you ready for the first one? Yes, um, I am. I'm going to read the clues out loud. I will also give you some examples and maybe synonyms because these are fill in the blank clues. Okay. And then for our audience, when you know the answer, I'd like you to write it down. Um, Darlene, I'd like to give you, I'd like you to give them a little time. So I will, whenever it's your turn, I'll ask you for what you think of as the clue. Okay. Okay. So number one across. Pay blank. Pay blank. It's related to focus, so you need to be focused and not distracted. And well, if you're not doing this, you're not listening anyway. So pay blank. Dr. Darlene, do you know a nine letter word for something that you pay? Okay, so if I were a student, I would count the blanks, like you said, and I, I, I'd start with that that, okay, there are nine spaces. So what word um, would fit those spaces that have to do with pay? And I see some of the participants have already guessed the answer. <laughs> and that answer is attention, attention. Attention, thank you. Okay, number four across. Take an active blank. Take an active blank four letters, and a synonym for this word is part. If you actively participate, you are less likely to lose focus on what is being said. So Darlene, do you know a four letter word that mm. goes with active or passive? Yes, and so does Chris Mahoney, oh. who said <laughs> role, R-O-L-E. Okay, thank you, good job, it is role. Number five across. Now we have an eight letter word. And this eight letter word is become blank with many topics. And it's a synonym for the word well known. The more that you know, the easier it is to recognize words and ideas. So we need to become blank with many topics. So oh. Darlene, do you know an eight letter word that goes oh. with something that you can become? Yes, I'm looking at Olga and Nadira oh. also know, and it is familiar. Hmm. We have some very smart people in our audience, don't we? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, our next one should be fairly easy. Okay. Our next one is to control, so two down, control your blank. Control your blank, and it's kind of like feelings. Okay, so this one has some other hints for us because there's um, mm -hmm. we have some letters that we can consider as we guess. And so... You also have some pictures there. <laughs> oh, we do. We also have pictures. <laughs> oh, so now we have, we heard from Chris, Ursula, Ursula Nodira, uh -huh. and Olga, um, and many others. And they said emotions. Emotions and, is correct. Good. Yes. And the last one is probably a phrase that you're familiar with. It's blank makes perfect. But I'm going to revise that to say that perfect blank makes perfect. 
I mean, athletes I like need to train in order to play. But what were we going to say, darling? No, no, no. Carry on. I said athletes need to train. And just like athletes need to train in order to play a better game, listeners also need to train and do exercises so that they could listen better, have a better listening game. So what actually I, I see that some people have already written the answers as well for this one as well. Mm hmm. The answer. So is what is three down? Practice. All right. Practice. So yeah. thank you. So these are the five different ways of um, five different strategies we can use for helping students improve their listening comprehension and actually monitor their attention. Um, so next, we have a question for the audience again. This is a longer question. Which strategy is the most challenging to teach and why? To pay attention, to control your emotions, to become familiar with many topics, to take an active role, or to practice to become more fluent. Okay, so which is again, the most we want challenging to, hear from to you. teach? Mm -hmm. We want to hear from you, our participants, which is most challenging. And while we wait for comments to start coming in, I'd like to share a co two comments that we received so far. And one is Nodira said, wow, I've never seen crossword listening. And then we, <laughs> <laughs> and then we heard from Ibrahim who said a wonderful activity regardless of our ages. We still love it. Uh, Michael said, I will love to implement in my classroom. And so now we're receiving some responses to the question, which strategy is most challenging to teach and why? Um, we heard from Ikram who said practice. We heard from Subhi who said, pay attention. Ibrahim said, take an active role. Uh, Rabia said, become familiar with many topics. Abid said, control your emotions. This is really hard. And I agree. <laughs> I agree. I think of myself trying to learn and uh, listen in, to another language that's not my language and my mm -hmm. first language. And just if I get really nervous, how I understand nothing or mm -hmm. I walk away and realize what they said uh, because my nerves got in the way. So, yes, controlling <laughs> emotions is so hard. Um, we also heard from Doris, who said, control your emotions as well. Ali said, pay attention. Miram said, practice to become more fluent. And Graciela said, to be get engaged to the thing. So I think so, it's, everything is difficult, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Every, like everything it. is challenging. Every, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we have strategy, so let's continue. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the one of the difficult things too, whenever we're teaching listening comprehension, is how is it that we can evaluate it? Uh, often, it's a it's easy for us to just fall into the trap of saying, "Okay, well, we'll give it a score, and that's how they're done." But that's not really evaluating their their level, and so. Um, Principle three is that we need to pay, we need to, uh, that what listeners understand is more important than how many words they know. And I'm going to demonstrate this by telling you a story. It's a story that I, I read in a primary book when I was teaching students in uh, Malawi. It's a story about the uh, lion and the fox. And I will answer, ask you a question at the end, and when your answer will tell me what level of understanding that you have. So Lion, the king of the jungle, sent out a message to all of the animals in the jungle that he was sick and dying and that they should come and listen to his last words. So many of the animals went to the, to the lion's cave, and Fox also went, but he didn't go inside. He just stood outside and he waited and he watched and he saw the uh, rabbits go in and the monkeys go in and the rats go in and the snakes go in, but none of the animals seemed to be coming out. After a while, the lion came out and the lion asked him, Fox, why haven't you come in to, to listen to me to tell my last words? And the fox said, Oh, I think it's very crowded in there. I've seen many animals go in, but I haven't seen any come out. So I'm going to ask you a question now. What do you think? 
why didn't Fox go into the cave to visit the lion? No, I... If, um, are you, go ahead. If, if you were to give me the answer that because it was too crowded inside, that would be a, a literal level of understanding because that's exactly what the fox said. He said that the animals have gone inside. But with, with intercultural listening, as one of our um, participants has said, he's a cannibal, so he's probably going to want to eat the fox. And so if the fox has thought about the motives of the lion and really the, the nature of the lion, then he would probably say that, I mean, you could say that he didn't want to go in because he didn't want to be eaten. And so that demonstrates a, a deeper level of understanding. A tool for, for evaluating the level of students' understanding that I found quite helpful is the ACTFL guidelines. ACTFL stands for the American College of Teaching of Foreign Languages. And what I like about theirs is they talk about the grammar and the, and the vocabulary. They talk about levels of that, but then they also give you guidelines for understanding culture and describing the different levels of culture. And the first, the beginner level or the novices really can understand, they recognize the basic formal and informal practices. So basically, if you can see it, they recognize them. So they might recognize weddings. They, if they were looking at this picture, they would see the, the fishermen, they would see the, the lake. And so they would recognize the things that are on the surface of the lake. And understanding culture is like that too. So as a novice, we can see what's on top of the lake, but we can't see what's under it. Now with, in, in developing a deeper understanding and so that we can actually see the fish, you would actually want to go to the intermediate level. And at the intermediate level, the students are beginning to recognize some patterns. So they might recognize that time or the morals or relationships or different ways of different patterns of power and responsibility, different ways of approaching cleanliness. These are all patterns that you can observe in a culture. And, and that, would, uh, that would affect their understanding. At the, at, at the advanced level, you actually most of the common cultural patterns, they recognize them. And then at the superior level, those that have the deepest understanding actually also have an appreciation for the cultural references and aesthetic properties of the language. And this could include things like beauty or humor, because I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I think one of the most difficult things to understand in another language is the jokes, because sometimes mm -hmm. they just go right over my head and I think, you know, what was so funny about that? Mm -hmm. um, one strategy for teaching this, other than telling stories, uh, is that you can use idioms, because idioms also can reveal the different levels of understanding. So if you have the idiom about um, tying the knot, so if I said that my friends tied the knot last month, what did they need? and you told me a rope, then I would say that that was probably the novice understanding because yes, you do need a rope to tie a knot. But if you actually understand a little bit more of our practices, then you would know that I was talking, that this idiom is talking about a wedding. And then at a superior level, you might even go to try to figure out what the history of that idiom was. And you might explore and find out that it's actually a Scottish um, wedding tradition that they used to tie ribbons uh, tied knots and ribbons around the bride and the groom's uh, wrists at, at the wedding ceremony. I think some American ceremonies do that as well. Mm -hmm. So principle, uh, what challenges might you face when creating activities to assess different levels of cultural understanding? Share your ideas in the chat. Okay, so we wanna hear from you. What challenges might you face when creating activities to assess different levels of cultural understanding. Let's see what, while we wait for the responses, um, actually we've already heard from, uh, we have a question. Mm -hmm. No, this is a comment, I'm sorry. It's from Aslam who said, when there is diversity of students in the class, it becomes difficult to teach. Mm -hmm. So yes, I can see how that could be the case. Um, especially with idioms, you having to go and, and, and give so much background and context for them mm -hmm. to even be comprehensible, you know? Yeah, um, sometimes. 
We also heard from Teet, who said to make inferences, learners need to expand not only their linguistic control, but knowledge of the world, own, or other cultures. Sanaya said, first challenge is what should be the starter activity for grabbing their attention? And then we heard from Irada, who said, little knowledge of Western mass culture. Um, we heard from Monica, who said, I think the hardest challenge is my own knowledge about different cultures. And then Lourdes said, instructions need to be written and clear. And finally, from Muhammad, we said, students with special needs. Oh, yes. That, that can be very, diff very challenging to try to figure out what their levels are, if, if they have other issues that are also interfering with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to you. Okay. Our last stop on our, in our adventure is about experiencing listening activities that include culture. And in this activity, I've, um, this is Jeopardy, which is an American game show. And I'm using Jeopardy to illustrate how to understand culture by studying its practices and, and its patterns. But also I'm, I'll be showing you how to do it by the various levels. So we'll be reviewing our principle three as well. Um, the good features of the Jeopardy game, or is it, I mean, one of the linguistic features is that it actually challenges students to form questions uh, if you play it properly. Now, to be honest, I often forget this part and my students just blurt out the answer and I accept it from them. Um, but it's, and it's also a good game for reviewing and introducing different topics. It's a great forum for trivia questions about culture and we'll be seeing that in just a minute. It appeals to students from all ages and I like the idea of the daily double because it really promotes listening. And I do have a daily double for us today. And hopefully we'll be able to get to it. We still have a few minutes left in our, in our webinar. Uh, now, there's a caution. You might need to revise the rules to keep one player from dominating the game. So often what I'll do is I'll, I'll rotate around and let the, the teams take turns answering the, choosing their question and answering their questions. Okay, so the goal of this game is to get points by answering the questions correctly. Uh, you'll need to divide the class into teams, give each team, a, the team will choose the category and the point value. I'll tell you what the clue is. I'll call on the te first team who raises their hand and let them respond. If they answer right, they get the points. If they don't, I don't usually subtract the points, though in the real game they do. And then the team, the team with the most points at the end wins. Sorry. Are you ready to play Jeopardy, um, Dor uh, darling? I am. I am. Jeopardy is one of my favorite games. I love Jeopardy. All right. <laughs> it's also my, my favorite game, and I like to watch it with my mother. And when we play it, uh, since it's on TV and there's no connection, so it's, it actually is a nice simulation for what we're doing right here, is that we just yell out our answers whenever we hear that. So okay. you can yell out your answers whenever you, when you know the answer and... Um, keep your points for yourself. I mean, you can keep your points. So if you can get the answer before uh, Darlene does, then you can award yourself points for that. Okay. So I will read the, the question, the custom of tying a knot, or tying the knot, a tradition from Scotland needs one of these. And then Darlene's answer would be, what is a wedding? And you notice how she formed it as a question. So are you okay. ready for the next, for the next one? I am. Okay, I didn't have enough time to create a full board today. So we just really have four more questions. Practices for 100, we just did. So you have 100 points. Um, we also have patriotism, practices for 200, plays for 300 and Proverbs for 400. I am going to go for the big points. I want Proverbs for 400. Um, I think that, I mean, the way I, I it should be hyperlinked, but I don't think it's hyperlinked today. So I think we don't, you don't get a choice today. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, you answered practices for 100. So you got your 100 points for that. Okay. Um, and they'll go on to the next question. The next question, which is 
um, patriotism for 100 is actually an audio daily double. And okay. what's special about your audio daily double, as I think you know from playing Jeopardy, is that you get to choose how many points it can be. So up to 400 points, how many points do you want to give to this question? I want 400. Patriotism. You want 400, okay? I do. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have a Jeopardy game on one of the thing, uh, one of the references, which my uh, on my blog. So, it, and when you're playing with that one, I have the star here. You could actually go back to the board, but to, in order to save time, we're just um, going step by step. Okay. okay. So here we have our question in the song "Yankee Doodle Dandy." I want you to listen to the song and tell he and tell me what he stuck in his hat. So he stuck a feather in his hat and called it what? So as you listen to the song, figure out what it was that he called the feather in his hat. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Okay, so he, he called it macaroni. Um, uh -huh. So that was um, uh, just the slang back in that day for something that was really stylish. So it would have to be Stylish Gentleman's Club. And that's exactly right. If you do a little bit of research, and it seems like you have done the research, um, there was actually macaroni wasn't, it was just a new noodle that had come out. And there was a Stylish Gentleman's Club in England, and they they wore feathers in their hats and they called themselves the Macaroni Club. Okay, let's go on to um, practices for 200. The best listener is like one of these. Hmm. Okay. Um, are there other clues? <laughs> uh, I think if you look at a pickle, uh, when you think of a pickle, you think of, uh, if you think of it in language, it's usually somebody's in trouble. Uh, bananas have slippery pills. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I would not think that. Often we will talk about somebody being cool as a cucumber. So uh, again, if we look back at your emotions, Mm -hmm. and try to stay calm so you can listen, I would think uh, the cucumber would be mm -hmm. the best listener. And that's right. So for 200 points, you have the cucumber. Okay. As cool as a cucumber. And okay. looks like Chris, now, Chris also did. Uh -huh. Okay, we need to move on quickly because we're running out of time. So if we can, let's go on and skip to 400. Okay. In his poem, Mending Wall, Robert Frost questions the proverb, good friends at fences make good neighbors. In his mind, the tools for a good relationship would include this. Would it be trust or hammer and nails? Um, for 400, what are hammer and nails? Hmm. Sorry, that was not the right answer. The correct answer is trust, because we're looking at the idea of neighbors. And uh, and actually, what Robert Frost is questioning is he's saying, why would you build a fence between you? And why would that make you a good neighbor? Trust would make you a better neighbor. And so also, when you talk about mending fences, our, our idiom about mending fences, it means like to forgive somebody or to repair your relationship. So that would be so a very we, novice response. Hammer and uh, nail. Actually, this not. is a very challenged question for a novice to tell you the mm -hmm. truth. This is mm -hmm. this is a superior question because we're actually looking at how it challenges their values and actually how Robert Frost is challenging the message of that particular proverb. Um, as a novice, um, so you the the wedding you can see the macaroni you could hear whenever you were listening to the song so. Those are very surface level things. Um, intermediate, so you have cool, cool as a cucumber. These are things that you can see, and but also mixed with things that you can't see. So you can see bananas and cucumbers and you can recognize what those are. 
but the idea underneath, the attitudes underneath about um, a, cu a cucumber being cool, meaning that it's somebody that's relaxed, or the banana means that somebody's going crazy. So, and then with the advanced, you actually get into more metaphors. So with the icebreaker, it's not really real ice that you're thinking about. You're thinking about the idea or the notion that we have of relationships that are warm and close um, being warm, and then those that are far apart being cold and icy. So you need something to break the ice in order to, to, um, to fix the relation or to build the relationship. And then in the superior, as we were talking about, so it's actually um, questioning your own values and thinking about you know, really what that what the proverb means about mending fence about mending fences. Okay, so uh, do we still have time? Are we finished? Yes, we're good. We're good. Okay, so we have actually I still have two more questions. So one question is, how do you follow these principles in teaching or in developing your own intercultural inter listening skills? Okay, so how do you follow these principles in teaching or in developing your own intercultural listening skills? Um, and the principles are restated there on our slide. Uh, while we wait for the responses, we have a question from Joseph Sanon who said, what is the meaning of the daily double? The meaning of the daily double is that whatever your score is, you can, since you're deciding how much the score should be, you can double your score. So if you had 500 points, then you could say 500 points and then your score would be doubled. So you would have a okay. thousand points if you answered correctly. Thank you. Um, so we did get a few responses. Mm -hmm. um, Danya said, I adore this activity. Um, Giovanna said, attention is the key. Edgar said, we played Jeopardy as a motivational activity and it was fun. Doris said, great ideas that I've never thought about before. Thank you so much. Um, Nadira said, observe practices and patterns would be um, the principle. Um, in teaching how what she would follow. Um, Danya said through practice and active learning. And mm -hmm. back to you. Okay, as I said, we had some deep dives. So if you really want to explore more, uh, we looked at the power of attention, creating a relaxed environment, the depths of understanding and activities that include culture. If you want to have a deeper dive, um, there is a, I have, pre, I have prepared an annotated reference list and these are the references. So Clopet gives us some ideas about um, if you're in a one culture classroom or when you're the same culture as your students, then you might want to look at this because she has some ideas of how to explore different cultures from within your own culture. Um, the next one there is a listening blog and this, the listening games on this blog were uh, some of them were created by me, but most of them were created by my my students in my teaching with games class this semester. Um, Hofstede has an interesting way of comparing culture. So if you really want to think about patterns, he gives some more ideas about the patterns and cultures and how they're different. Um, on the next page, you have Mendelssohn, who, who has some really good ideas and strategies about um, nonverbal communication. And then Noonan and King actually have, can explain a little bit more about teaching culture and critical thinking. And they, they deal with the metaphor about you know, the things being on the surface and then what's under the water. So our final exit ticket is, how has this adventure inspired you? I appreciate the time that I've been able to spend with you today. It's been fun. And I hope you've also enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you, Johnny, for sharing these wonderful, wonderful approaches to help students become successful learners. And we'd like to thank you, our participants, for your engagement and participation today. Please continue to share your ideas on social media and with your viewing groups after the session ends. <laughs>